Hey everybody, good to have you back with us again today. In our last session, we discussed the beginnings of industrialization in England, and today we'll continue our story by examining how the Industrial Revolution spread and grew around the world. So let's take a look at those essential questions. We'll start with literally exactly what I just said, and that's the spread of industrialization. How did industrialization spread from its birthplace in England to other parts of the world? How does industrialization go from being just an England thing to a much more global phenomenon? Then we'll look at an economic system called capitalism and we'll see how it provided the perfect environment for the growth of industrialization. What is capitalism and how did it allow industrialization to grow and flourish and how does the desire for greater profits under this economic system of capitalism lead ultimately to the advent of mass production techniques. Uh, and with, in terms of mass production industrialization, we'll look at some terminology, interchangeable parts, division of labor, the assembly line method. We actually have uh, like a hundred years of stuff that we need to get through here, so we better get started right away. So those are the essential questions. Without further ado, let's get this ball rolling. So once industrialized, England becomes the most productive nation in the world with their new machines, their new innovations, their factory system. They're producing more goods, they're producing them faster, more efficiently, which means more money. And more money, of course, means more power. England is the most productive nation in the world, and they want to stay that way. To stay on top, England wanted to keep its industrial secrets just that a secret. Okay, They didn't want to let the cat out of the bag. They didn't want anyone to know what their secrets were because then their rivals would be able to catch up with them. It was actually illegal for any scientists or inventors or industrial plans to even leave the country in England. And so they were able to keep things under wraps for a really long time, but it wasn't going to stay that way. In 1789, a man by the name of Samuel Slater escaped to America. And I use the term escaped because people like him really weren't allowed to leave England. Uh, he was by trade a, a machine engineer, a machine mechanic. From the time he was 15 years old, he worked in a textile mill, in a textile factory. And his job was to service the machines, to fix broken parts, make new parts. And so he had a real intimate knowledge of how the factory and how the machines worked. Well, in 1789, old Sam Slater decided that he wanted to set off on his own. He was a young man, he was in his 20s by now, and he decided that America would be the place for his future. So he disguised himself as a common farmer, hopped a ship, and headed off to America with nothing but the clothes on his back and a few bucks in his pocket. Now, once he got to America, he used his knowledge of these industrial machines to completely rebuild an industrial spinning wheel from memory alone. He didn't bring plans with him. He didn't bring tools with him. All he did was rebuild this thing from memory. And soon he started selling it and others of England's industrial secrets to uh, wealthy investors who were interested in this kind of thing. And once he had enough money himself, he even opened his own textile factory in Rhode Island. And so now, before you know it, England's industrial secrets are out and the Industrial Revolution has spread to America. Well, once the British realize that their secrets are out, they come to the realization that keeping them a secret is no longer profitable. So they just start selling their industrial ideas to other parts of the world, thus spreading industrialization to other nations. And if we were to fast forward 80 years to 1870, the three most industrialized nations in the world are Great Britain, of course, because that's where it started, Germany, and the good old United States of America. But how does industrialization manage to grow and flourish so fast in such a short period of time? Well, all of that goes back to an economic system that was prevalent during this time period, an economic system that we call capitalism or free enterprise or the free market system. Capitalism is an economic system where private individuals or firms control the businesses, control the means of production. See, you compare this to mercantilism, which had been popular in the 1600s when uh, European nations were establishing colonies around the world. Mercantilism, with its government-centered regulations and controls of colonies and trade and economic activity, well, capitalism is very different from that because instead of government owning and controlling everything, it's the private individual who owns and controls their businesses. And unlike mercantilism, where government was heavily involved in everything, capitalism stresses a lack of government government interference. The private individuals own and operate their businesses without regulation or interference from the government. And so without government interference, capitalists or entrepreneurs, remember the people who take risks and start businesses, they own their own businesses, they operate them as they see fit, all with the goal 
of making as much money as possible. See, under capitalism, we look out for our own self-interest, and our self-interest is the profit motive. We want to make as much money as possible so that we can become as wealthy as possible. Uh, and that's kind of the goal here, and capitalism drives a lot of that. And because capitalists seek to maximize their profits, businesses ultimately end up competing with one another. And so in order to make themselves as profitable as possible, businesses invest more money into machinery and new technology, and that further drives industrialization. And to sell and produce more products, the entrepreneurs then open more factories and they hire more workers. And this further helps industrialization to grow and flourish. And all of it comes from capitalism and the private individual running their businesses they see fit, following the profit motive, and this is allowing industrialization to really grow. Think about, if you will, say the smartphone industry in the US today. Apple with its iPhone, if they had no competition whatsoever, would Apple have ever had to really grow and innovate their products? If they had no competition, you'd still be working from the first version of the iPhone. But because they get competition from people like Samsung, Samsung wanting to compete with Apple for profits makes a better product. So what does Apple have to do? Innovate and make another better product. And then what does Samsung have to do? Innovate and make another better product. And so this constant game of one-upsmanship as they compete with each other for profits allows the smartphone industry to continue to grow and grow and grow and further develop. And that's exactly what's happening with competition and capitalism allowing industrialization to further grow and flourish and develop. And so all of these things, the competition, the desire for profits, uh, it allows industrialization, innovation, the economy to grow and to flourish. And so we see that capitalism provides the perfect environment for the growth and the spread of industrialization. Now, looking to further increase their profits, these manufacturers, who of course are capitalists, invest in machines to replace their more costly human labor because you're always looking for a way to drive your costs down so you can make more money. Now, this is because a system called interchangeable parts had been developed by a name that you might know, a guy by the name of Eli Whitney, famous cotton gin, that guy. Uh, he came up with this uh, idea of interchangeable parts where machines would make identical parts that can all be easily assembled or exchanged. Changed. So rather than, say, one person building one chair all by themselves by hand and making all the parts, you instead have a machine that prefabricates all the parts of the chair. And one person simply grabs all the prefabricated parts and puts the chair together. Interchangeable parts makes production a lot faster and more efficient, which means more money. So now, using interchangeable parts along with fast working machines, industrialists can mass produce goods. Mass production allows manufacturers to produce huge quantities of goods at much, much lower prices. And when it costs you less to make something, it means that you make more money. Capitalism and the profit motive are driving all of this industrial growth. Some years later, Frederick Taylor would add to this mass production concept with his idea of the division of labor. Now, Frederick Taylor is kind of what you might call an efficiency specialist. He called his methods um, scientific management, if that makes any sense. Basically, he tried to find ways to make production more efficient, and what he realized was that by having one person produce one item at a time, you were not nearly as efficient as you ought to be. Instead, he encouraged manufacturers to divide tasks, like building a product, into detailed, specific segments of a step-by-step -step process. So, rather than one person building one chair at a time with all these prefabricated interchangeable parts, instead what you do is you have three or four people each do one step in the process of making a chair. One person does one thing over and over and over again, uh, and together everyone manages to produce that product, in this case, that chair. Now his ideas will eventually give rise to the assembly line method. The concept of the assembly line method where a worker would perform a specific task on a product as it moved by on a conveyor belt, that would grow out of this division of labor. And in 1913, one Henry Ford of the Ford Motor Company would use this method, this assembly line method, to mass produce his Model T cars.
and the mass production of his Model T cars made them much cheaper for him to produce and much more affordable for the consumer to buy, which means he sold a whole lot of them and made a whole lot more money. And this idea of the assembly line method, which was really revolutionized during this time, early 1900s, uh, will, will be the norm for how things are produced today. So industrialization through the pursuit of the profit motive through capitalism has changed the way that today we produce goods, whether they be toys or whether they be computers, whether they be cell phones, mass production, the assembly line method is still the norm. And all of that stems from industrialization, it stems from capitalism, it extends from seeking profit in the free market economy. Well, let's leave it at that for today, guys. We saw the spread of industrialization, how industrialization spread from its birthplace in England to other parts of the world. Samuel Slater fled England, went to America, and spread the ideas of industrialization, and soon uh, they were all over the place. We also saw how capitalism and uh, its desire for private individuals to focus on making as much money, as much profit as possible, allowed industrialization to grow and flourish. From there, we saw the growth of mass production, the assembly line method, and a real change in how all the way to this very day, we still mass produce products in massive manufacturing operations. So those are the essential questions, guys. Make sure that you study those and know those. Be ready to talk about that stuff the next time that we meet. And as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.